Good morning. Good to see you. My name's Randy, and first-time guest. We're always excited to have you today. Thank you for being with us. Hope to get to know you a little bit better at the tent right after this. We also would love to give you a little gift for um, giving us the little contact card that you have in, your, in the pew rack, or you might have already been uh, given earlier today. And uh, just want to welcome all of you online. Also, especially want to give a shout out to Jenny in Jonesboro, Arkansas, of all places. Jenny in Jonesboro. I just need to assure you, your son is here now, and he is growing in his faith. He'll be at the next hour. He's taking good care of all of us. So we're glad that you watch every Sunday also that, that you can. So hope you're doing okay. Hope your summer has gone well. We are in Genesis 50 today. So I'll let you have a chance to turn to that. Grab the, a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you didn't bring one or turn your device on and out there also. It's always better to see it in, in print or on the screen than just to, to listen to me. I think there are two things that we all are going to deal with mentally. And especially once you get to be closer to 50 and above in age, two things we're always going to deal with. Has my life counted for anything? Has there been any significance in my life that will, that will be here after I'm gone? And the other thing is, if you are a parent, what am I passing down to my next generation that will go to the following? The Bible talks a lot in the Old Testament about blessing the next down to the fourth generation. We believe in, as, as a Coach said earlier, we believe in blessing the rest. Will I bless the rest of my people, my tribe, to the point that they will live on stuff that I have shared with them after I'm gone. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, good news. Though our bodies are wasting away, our spirits are being renewed every single day. So no matter what age we get to be, God's plan is our bodies do start to deteriorate and things start to fall apart there. But on the inside, man and woman, we really should be better than ever. We should be more fresh than ever, more vibrant than ever. And every time I celebrate baptism, I think of that because that spans all ages. And that's a huge statement that no matter who you are and where you are, God can reach. And God loves you enough to want to do that. So we're going to learn regarding those two things some good news also. And here's, I'll just say it several times today. Grace and forgiveness come from the same place. Joseph is a great example of that. His legacy that we've studied, we're in part seven today. We're going to say goodbye to Joseph today, okay? It's been seven weeks and I've, I've enjoyed it. I love, I've always loved the story of Joseph for a lot of reasons. One is it's just this. He is that example of grace and forgiveness that God gives us in tandem. He is a study of how a true leader should respond to adversity. He is a study of how there is a sacredness to suffering. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today too. It is also a study of maybe how a dysfunctional family in the end can still be redeemed and still be renewed because many of us have that going on in our families today also. So you might, have, you might have read what I read the other day about these three guys that all finished college the same semester. They had grown, went through elementary school together. They're great friends. They all went to different schools when they got their degrees. They decided to celebrate. They all met up in Tijuana, and they had a big time one night in Tijuana. They'd had a little bit too much in the way of adult beverages, and they woke up the next morning in a Mexican jail. And, lo and behold, they found out they had been convicted of something and sentenced to the electric chair. So they couldn't get an answer. They couldn't get a straight answer for what they had done, and they sure didn't know of anything. And so they go and they get the first guy, and they take him, and they strap him into the chair. And he says, hey, I want you to know I just got a degree from Union Theological Seminary. And I know that the innocent will be upheld by God. God will protect the innocent, and he will protect me. Boom, they threw the switch, and nothing happened. 
At that point, everybody in the room falls to their knees and says, please forgive us. You are innocent. He does. They bring the next guy in there. They strap him into the chair, and he says, I want you to know I've, I've got a degree now from Harvard Law School, and we were taught that justice will prevail in the end, and justice will prevail here. I am innocent. I will not. I will survive this they throw the switch and nothing happens and they same thing they fall to their knees oh please forgive us you obviously were innocent they bring the third guy in there and he says hey i want you to know i have a degree in electrical engineering from the (laughs) university of texas and there ain't nobody gonna get electrocuted today until you plug that thing in over there and stop (laughs) so my apologies for all you texans in the room. So we, to bring you up to speed, Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers after all these years. There's this huge, most dramatic moment in the Old Testament. They are reconciled. He exercises grace and forgiveness. He has the rest of his family brought down, including his father that he's not seen in over two decades. His father lives out his life there in Egypt. Before he dies, he does what they did in those days. He brings his children in, and one by one, he blesses each of them individually. And some of it is prophetic about where the tribes of Israel will wind up. And then he dies. There's a a huge, prolonged period of grief. And Joseph decides, I'm going to take my father back to the homeland, and I'm going to bury him where he wanted to be, with Father Abraham, with his father, Isaac. And he will be rested. And a huge entourage of Egyptians and Hebrews make that long trek back. They get back, and that brings us up to speed in chapter 50 up to about verse 15. And that's where we'll pick up today with our narrative on grace and forgiveness Because there's three things I want to share with you that I think apply to me and you today. We live in a world that needs plenty of grace and plenty of forgiveness. So the first thing is from verse 19. I'm going to read verses 15 to 19 if you'll follow along with me. Because grace allows God to be the judge. He is the judge. We don't get to be judge. And he does a very good job at that. So let's start with verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we have done? They're they're still fearing retribution after all these years, after all this time together. 16, so they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father left us instructions before he died. Their father was Jacob. This is what you were to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they have committed In treating you so badly, now please forgive the sins of the servants of God your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. First of all, their strategy is let's soften him up. Let's send messengers, you know, with this message. Daddy told you us to tell you, you know, to go easy on us. And then they come right behind him, and you'll see what they do next. Where'd they learn that from? They learned it from their father, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, remember that? He sends just wave after wave of family members with gifts ahead of him. He brings up the rear. Maybe it'll soften him up and he won't go be so hard on me. They just learned to do what their father had done. But why is Joseph weeping? Joseph is weeping because after all these years and all this time and all of his example of being genuine to his word, they still don't trust his word. They still fear him turning on them. And now they don't have the protection of their father, they feel like. And he is, I think, utterly disappointed at all of that. Verse 18, and the brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves. Not the first time they've said that. Not the first time they've bowed before him. By my count, this is six times that they've bowed themselves before him. True to his dream that got him in all this trouble way back when he was 17 years old. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? In other words, 
Has God exchanged places with me? Has God put me on the throne of your life and he has taken a vacation? Is what literally the Hebrew... And, and of course, that's the answer to that is no. And so one more time, he extends them grace and he extends them forgiveness. Why is he able to do this? Because as we've said, he made that decision a long time ago, way back here years ago. He made the decision to forgive them. And when they showed up after at least 22 years, the first time, and he recognizes them, and he has to draw on them because they don't even know who he is, he had already pardoned them and let it go, which is what, which is what forgiveness is really all about. Why are the brothers acting like they are acting? They're acting true to form off and on their entire time that we have known them through this. Why is that? Because they're not dominated by faith. They're dominated by fear. It clearly says this. And fear will cancel your faith and my faith if I allow it to. That's on the screen behind me. If we give way, we can say we're men and women of faith all day long, but when tested, if we resort to fear and we're led by fear, we cannot have the right amount of faith that we should have. This is where Joseph is different than his brothers. He has operated by faith over fear. He's had to. God was all he could depend on for a stretch of about 13 years at least. And now that he's in a place of power and privilege, and has leverage over all of them, he's still the same man. That's why he's so disappointed. He's the same guy as, as he was in prison and the same guy as he was when he was a servant in somebody else's house. And he shows us how to walk by faith. And verse 15 alludes to that. I know what some of you are thinking, because I have been here. Does this mean that I basically just got to spend the rest of my life getting walked all over. Am I going to be a doormat? Can people treat me any way they want to? And because I'm a Christ follower, I just got to let it go. I got to forgive them and I got to let it go. No, you do not. We are commanded to forgive. But there's also this little verse that I love in John 1, 14. You may want to write this down. John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus came full of grace and truth. There are two sides to this. There is grace, but there's also truth. Now, Jesus got the mixture perfect. Randy does not get the mixture perfectly some days, and you probably don't either. But the premise of this is there are days that we are to forgive and move on. There also are other days that we need to speak the truth and correct injustices or take action when we are called by the Holy Spirit to do that. Can I give you a biblical example? I, I love illustrations because it helps me to learn. David is that guy. David was wronged by King Saul and by a guy named Nabal, Nabal who was a very wealthy um, agriculturalist both guys greatly wronged him, and he was innocent, but he chose to give both of them grace, which meant they're still guilty. They've still wronged me, but I'm leaving them to God to be their judge, and God did judge both of them. But there's other times when he, has, when he makes war with the Jebusites, God had spoken, moved the capital from Hebron to what we call now Jerusalem. The Jebusites lived there. Nobody had ever even challenged them because they were so fortressed in to where they were on that plateau. Nobody had even had the courage to try it. David not only tried it, he said, oh, I'll get in there, and he did. He spoke the truth to them in his action militarily, and he took it, and he lived there the rest of his life. There was also an event earlier in his life when, as a teenager, he sees a guy across the valley shouting blasphemous insults and swearing at his God, you know that story, Goliath, and he takes him on too. And he decides, no, nope, the truth of the matter is, you don't blaspheme my God and me stand by idly and watch it happen. I don't care if you're nine and a half feet tall. And so with that, David 
takes on the giant, and of course, he wins. There's the mixture. It requires grace and truth. And that's where you and I have to deal with the Lord and the Holy Spirit over that because it's easy to cross the, cross the, the hairs there. But with God, we should be able to get that right more than we get it wrong because His grace and His forgiveness come from the same place. And we've all received plenty of both of those things, agreed? Second thing is we, we learn is grace will change your suffering into salvation. That's real good news because we all have these periods of what we would classify as suffering. So now look at verse 20. You may want to underline verse 20 in your Bible if you haven't already. This is the most famous verse in the whole legacy of Joseph. He says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Egyptian and Hebrew and even other ethnic groups were coming in during the famine and buying the grain from the dream revealed to Joseph to interpret that the Pharaoh had had in that day, and he's absolutely true. He says the same thing in different words in chapter 45, verse 7 and 8. I think that was your topic last week where he basically says the first time when he revealed himself to his brothers, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to show you a little bit of grace because I see the big picture. God always has a bigger conversation, and I realize it now. This was supposed to happen. Doesn't make you innocent, but it was supposed to happen. Verse 21, so then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Everything y'all hinges on this simple concept of God is sovereign. If God is really sovereign, we got to trust him when we don't understand things. If he's really sovereign, we got to trust him even when we're in pain. If he's sovereign, we got to trust him even when we obviously have been wronged and somebody ought to pay for that. Because he does. He always has a bigger plan. Everybody in the Bible that we've read about and we admire maybe because of their strength and courage and faith. They went through these periods, and every one of them at the end of the day relied on the sovereignty of God to work out what they could not control or could not address. And what makes me and you any different from that? So can I share something with you? If me and you suffer for the cause of Christ, let's say, and we do it without grace, we're going to live in the past. We have no good real view or joy or hope headed into the future because the suffering will turn us and our attention toward what happened. And if some of you are like me, I have spent periods of my life getting up every morning, doing a flashback to, yep, why did that happen back there? Why did I get caught in the middle of that? Why did this happen that I did not deserve? And if we don't have the orientation of Christ to turn us from that to be able to exercise the grace and forgiveness, we will continue to move, to move not in the future, but we'll keep living in the past. There's a word called sanctification, and that basically just means that as a Christ follower, we are charged with growth and maturity. It's not all going to happen today, but today being today, I am challenged, and you are too, by a God who loves you to get a little bit more mature today. One of the sharpening ways of maturity is to let things happen that we don't like and to let us deal with a little bit of pain at times and a little bit of injustice. God's not trying to be vindictive. He's not trying to be cruel. But here's what some of you know that I've had to learn too. He's not particularly concerned if I'm not comfortable. Anybody have that experience? 
Now, I can whine and complain to him all day long, and he'll listen to it, but nothing will change because I am uncomfortable. And he'll allow me to be uncomfortable as long as it takes to either learn the lesson or get more mature or just because there is a bigger purpose and I'm the one that happens to be in the middle of it. That's the way he works. You know, by the time we see in a few verses Joseph passes away, I did the math this week, these boys will have been together 75 years. They're still, and these, they're still fear-dominated. 75 years later, he is still faith-oriented. We all choose. We all choose which day, I mean, which way that we're going to go with that. So can I deal with something else that is in the room because we're all human? And I'll confess maybe to being part of this in the past too. And that is um, the times that maybe you possibly or even now you're mad at God. You got hurt. And it's a deep cut. And it's not healing very well. And your only option you have decided is because he is sovereign and because he could have stepped in, but he didn't step in, that maybe he's not quite for me and not as trustworthy as I have been led to believe. And that maybe, you listen, maybe my life will be better without him. And there's tons of people that have walked away from a close relationship with God and they have walked away from his house, the church, also. And God always gives us the choice. But can I share something from my heart with you? When you have walked away in the past, possibly, or I have walked away from his family, the church... That doesn't solve the issue. It doesn't go away. It doesn't make that not a reality. In fact, it hurts us more because now we're not giving God an opportunity to develop our faith, which was probably one of his purposes for allowing that to happen in the first place. And he's not allowing us to do it within a community of other people that understand it or may need to learn from you and me of what it is like to be a Christ follower in the good and the bad. Because we need examples today of men and women of God who don't retreat, who not only take your stand, but you advance. You run into the trouble. You go into the fire. You deal with the pain and the disappointment and maybe even the suffering, not because you want to, but because it's the right thing to do. Because one day a lot of other people are going to be inspired and strengthened and may even know Jesus for the first time because of you. Nobody ever gets stronger by retreating. Nobody ever figures it out by just canceling out God. And so I just need to encourage you as best I can. He's okay with you being mad at him. He's not offended by that. He's not hurt by that. He understands that. But he still is God and he still loves you and he still has plans beyond this. Nothing is so bad that it can outdo his plans for you because he cannot negate a promise. And he never will. James 1, 2 through 4, that's another good read for this week. What's that about? It's about just what we're talking about. He says, consider it joy when you suffer. Now, he's not saying look forward to it. He's saying while you're in it, you might as well keep your joy and you might as well keep your forward approach. 
and keep advancing and keep putting one step. That's what Joseph does so well. That's what a leader does, and Joseph was a leader. He keeps putting one step ahead of the other. He keeps moving forward. And that's what James 1, 2 through 4 is really saying there. So I don't know where your suffering is coming from. I don't know where your biggest level of pain is, but he does. And I'm just encouraging you. Don't deny it. Don't dress it up and make it look better than it is. Don't fake your way through it. Deal with it. If it stinks, tell him it stinks. If you're mad or hurt or disappointed in him, tell him. But do it with the attitude of, I'm still your son. I'm still your daughter. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still in your family. Because he's certainly not going to go anywhere. Have I told you grace and forgiveness go together? They come from the same place. Third thing is, uh, let's, we're gonna, let's read 22 through 25. Third thing is grace um, inspires the subsequent generations. There's always another generation coming, whether they're our kids or somebody else's kids. So let's look at verse 22. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived to be 110 years old. Trivia question. They didn't get it in the 815. What other biblical leader in the Old Testament lived to be 110? Close. I, I was thinking Moses first. Close. Moses mentored Joshua. It's Joshua, yeah. And saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. That's his son. And also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh. Manasseh is his other son. Were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I love this verse, and I'll tell you why. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. He's pretty frank about that, you know. I'm about to die. God had told him that, I guess. But, but then look, but God. I'm about to die, but God will surely come to you, surely, surely come to you and take you up out of his land to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was their father and Isaac was their grandfather. And Joseph 25 made the sons of Israel swear uh, an, an oath. And he said, God will surely come to you and then and take you up. And you must carry my bones up from this place. What in the world? He makes them not just promise. He makes them take an oath. Why does he make his brothers take an oath? Are you kidding me? Have you been around this summer? Would you trust them to do something just on their word? Of course not. He says, man, I love y'all, and I've forgiven you and everything, but this is important to me. Let's just put it in writing to make sure. But what's he asking them? Take my bones up out of here. Transport me back to the homeland because I see the day coming when our descendants are all going to leave Egypt and, the, and, and we're going to go home. And I'm so sure about this. I want to go too. I want to go. I want to be buried next to dad, next to granddad, next to great great grandfather because that's what God gave us to do. Can I remind you of something? Grace is given, it's not earned, so we have to give it. We can't expect people to earn it. We all should be glad and grateful for that because God's grace is given and not earned, right? If we earned our grace, we'd all be in big trouble. And so we need to remind ourselves of that. And here's where it gets personal to you and personal to me. Our level of godliness when our day is over will be far greater value to the people we leave behind than our accomplishments, than our wealth, 
than our stock portfolio, than our, than our house up in the mountains, than that pickup truck that everybody covets that, you know, we wouldn't sell to them, and all of that stuff. Our godliness and the, care, the content of our character, that's what the surviving family and friends remember. It really is. And that's what they'll remember from Joseph. So the point of this is parents are uh, folks who have influence on somebody else's children. In what way can you, while there's time, in what way can you bless them, bless the rest of them, that next generation and the next, to the point with such gifts that they'll take that and treasure it the rest of their life. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about stuff. That's great. Giving them gifts and all like that, that's fantastic. But that won't last. What will you give them that they will carry, that they will remember you by, not because it's you necessarily, but God inside of you? What will deeply influence their life as a spiritual blessing that you have for them? I've told you a story where, I, you know, there's certain older people when I was a kid that I overheard praying for me by name. I didn't know Jesus, but I remember it stopping me in my tracks as something curious, as like, wow, they... They must really care about me if they're going to that trouble and being that specific. And that's what we need to be all about. I know this, it's on your screen in a minute, grace will not leave regrets. The people you extend grace to and the people you decide to forgive, you will not regret it on your deathbed. Now, you may regret the opposite of that the people you did not extend grace to or the people you did not forgive. And Joseph is determined, y'all. Joseph is not going to die after living 109 years the right way. He's not going to die at 110 with regrets. He is going to finish well. And many of you are on that same path. You're going to finish well. Because you pre-decided, as he did a long, long time ago, to let things go when God is really the judge and your suffering has a purpose, is for the salvation of other people more than likely. And also, there's always a next generation watching you. And they're going to take their cues from what you do or what you don't do. Another good read for you if you want to write this one down, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through... Well, really, all, the, all of chapter 2 of Ephesians is where he talks about this issue also. He, he reminds us, you know, you once were dead, and now you're alive. You were far from God, and now you're close to God because of His grace, nothing else. You, you had enough sense to believe in Him and to trust Him because of his grace that he poured into you. That's the only thing you can take credit for. But because of that, you can live in this light of his grace and his mercy. So let's finish the story here. Look at verse 26. Everybody at verse 26. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. When 400 years pass. After 400 years, God raises up a great deliverer. His name was Moses. And Moses walks in and gets Pharaoh to release hundreds of thousands, probably, of Hebrew slaves out of slavery, and they're walking out free. And then they go to Mount Sinai, and they get the Ten Commandments, and they put it in something called the Ark of the Covenant. For the next 40 years, they drag around two wooden cabinets. One contained the, the Ten Commandments. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. The other wooden cabinet was Joseph's bones <laughs> that they're dragging around. They did it. They honored his request, and 400 years later, 
When they get there, they bury Joseph. For 1,400 years after that moment, God raises up another great deliverer. His father was also called Joseph. He was Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus lived not a good life. Jesus lived a perfect life. And he was perfectly full of grace and truth. And, and right up to his last moment, he loved and gave grace and forgave and spoke to truth. And he gave his life for you and me, only to be resurrected on the third day. Since by his atoning blood shed on the cross, you and I have the opportunity to come to him, not by any other means, but by faith based on the grace that he's given us. We're eligible because of his grace and no other reason. You can cure cancer tomorrow. You're still going to come to him by grace that he gives you and no other reason. And so there's this legacy. These three men all had one thing among others in common. You know what? They, prove, they show us dreamers never stop dreaming, do they? Joseph shares another dream right before he dies at 110. Take my bones and get them out of here and take them out. And they do it. They do it. All three of these men had dreams that impact us today. And what a blessing we have. So while you have time and I have time, please... Let's look to our next generations of our children and others as well as other people's children, and let's bless them. Let's bless them with the spiritual stuff, the stuff that will last after we're gone. So the question is, what will you uh, pass down to the next generations? What Next one. What will you pass down to the next generations? I'll tell you a quick story. Because, again, I think illustrations help, us, help me learn and help you learn. There was a man one day that um, waited till he was elderly to write down some thoughts of an event that had happened to him over 60 years earlier. And that event was as a young, brand-new deacon in a small church that he was serving in and was beginning to start a family in, as a new deacon... They were trying to position themselves toward the future, this little church. And he and one other man decided that God was pretty clearly telling them that this was a course that they needed to take. The only problem was they were the only two among the deacon group. They were the only two among a committee and other things. And it went on like that. Every time a little vote was taken within that group, it would be six to two. And this man and one other man would stand alone. And they never folded up. They, were, they just quietly, solidly stood by the truth of what they knew to be right for that church. And it got to a point that one big issue was resolved. But on the night that it was issued, this young man was publicly humiliated in front of the whole church body. Stripped of his deaconship in order to leave the church. And he had done nothing wrong other than cast his vote. And so he did what the only thing to do, he left. And he ended up a couple of years later starting a little business in that town. And for the next 40 years, he operated that business under the noses of those very people in that town that had treated him and his family so poorly. He never heard of a word of an apology from anybody. He never had a word of explanation of even why it happened. He just lived with the knowledge that it happened, and so did they. He didn't quit on God, though. He moved and immediately went to another place of worship and joined that church and began his family. And he was faithful. He became chairman of deacons. He taught a class forever. He was that solid, strong, quiet man of conviction there that he was before all that happened. And he waited until he was 88 years old to put all of that memory down in writing. 
And the reason he did it then, he wanted to give a gift to his children. Not that he was a great deal, but an example of God's grace and forgiveness because he recorded it in the, on the third page of that that he, on his way out the door that night in that church where he was so badly mistreated, he forgave them. He chose to forgive them that night. I know that to be true because that was my father. I also know that if I had been in that position on that night, I would have not forgiven anybody more than likely that night. It would have taken a while. We will be remembered, not by what we accomplished, but who we are. And that will always remain the greatest gift that my father gave me was the accounting of the most painful period of his life because I see Jesus Christ on the pages of that pain. And he gives you the same ability and me the same ability. We just got to depend on him. We have got to trust him, y'all. If we can't trust him, we trust nobody. And nobody in the subsequent generations get any better. They get worse. But if we get it right, they will get better. And their children will get better down to the fourth generation. So Braden is going to come, and we have the awesome opportunity to stand and, and worship through song one more time. And I'd love to see you down here if you need to come and pray or you need to just become a part of this church or, or whatever you need to do. Why don't you stand and let me pray for you. Lord, the things we don't understand, the things we don't like, the things we don't appreciate, train us and discipline us and challenge us to still stand on our convictions and still stand by what we do know is right. We know you're an unchanging God. We know that you are a God of promise and provision. And you have never turned your back on one of your children, and you never will. And so, God, right in this moment, whatever is next that we need to do in order to become a better Christ follower, would you give us the ability to do it now? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.